Welcome back everyone to another episode of The Road Chose Me. My name's Dan and it's time for a whole new season and a whole new set of adventures. So I've had a bit of a break for the winter. The sun is out now, most of the snow is gone and it's time for me to start building a brand new overland vehicle. So Katie and I have plans to go to an entirely new part of the world and I think that means we need a new vehicle. So I have a lot of criteria to go through and a lot of reasons and a lot of whys that I'm going to choose the vehicle that I'm going to choose. So if you're interested in overlanding, if you wanna know how I go about selecting a vehicle, after all, this is my fourth vehicle for my fourth major expedition around the world. If you wanna know how I go about that, that's what I'm gonna talk about in all detail in today's video. Let's get into all the details, how to select an overland vehicle. So when it comes to choosing an overland vehicle, there are so many choices out there. In fact, there are more choices now than ever. That's a really good thing, but it does make the decision a hard one. I think it used to be a lot easier when there just weren't so many choices. And I personally, I approach this just like those multiple choice questions from back in school, where I try to eliminate all the ones that just immediately don't make sense. That way I don't have to spend time thinking about them and they're just already off my list. That makes it way easier for me to then have a short list of things that actually could work for my needs. And something I really wanna stress here is I'm not telling you which vehicle you should have. That makes no sense because I don't know what your needs are. How many people you've got traveling, where you wanna go in the world, how you wanna camp, how you like to cook and eat, all of those things they're up to you and the vehicle that you choose is going to define that. So if anyone out there tells you what vehicle you should have, or they just right off the bat, they say, get a Gladiator, they're amazing. Yeah, I would kind of ignore that advice. And I would say that's not very helpful because it can't possibly apply to what you want to do and where you want to go in the world. So what I'm going to do in today's video, I'm not going to tell you what vehicle you should get. I'm going to go through the whys and the what's and understand what are the criteria I'm using to narrow down the field until there really aren't that many choices left. And you'll see through my thinking process and through all of the different sort of honing down, I just whittle away all of the ones that don't make sense until the choice kind of makes itself. So with that said, what are my major criteria for an overland vehicle? Well, I did this video a few years ago where I talked about the five major features Let's revisit that and let's update it now that I've learned even more from my most recent expedition around Australia. The first thing I said is that it has to fit inside of a 20 foot shipping container because I wanna travel internationally. That is as true as ever. The vehicle that I'm building this time absolutely will go in a container and will go around the world. So that is a must for me. The next thing is that I said it has to get 20 miles a gallon or better. Again, that is more true than ever. We're gonna revisit this one in just a minute. I also said it has to be left-hand drive, which is still true. And I also now am adding to that, I don't wanna have any strange imports. I don't wanna import some Land Cruiser or some Defender from some part of the world, bring it here to North America. It's kind of strange for legality. It's hard to get spare parts. But more than that, people here in North America, they're not gonna be inspired by that. They're not gonna look at that and say, wow, I can do what Dan's doing. So. I'm not gonna get one of those vehicles. I want a vehicle that you can just walk in and buy here in North America relatively pain-free. Next thing that I actually forgot to mention last time is budget for me. I'm not a rich YouTuber. I don't have a million subscribers. Maybe you can help me out with that. One day when I do, maybe I'll get an Earth Roamer. Maybe I'll have some huge big Iveco truck with a box camper on the back. Probably not. But even if I wanted one right now, it's not even possible. So really any vehicle that is that expensive, I just chop them off and say, I can't have them because they cost too much. This thing behind me and three years around Africa, all in cost me half as much as an Earth Roamer, cost me a 10th as much as a big Iveco with a box truck. So I know how I'd rather spend my money, buy a used vehicle, deck it out to meet my needs, and then spend the rest of the money on gas in the tank so that I can go and have adventures. So budget is a really important consideration for me. And then the fifth one 
is interior living space. And I've said it so many times before, I think that changes your trip more than all the other things put together. So for me, that is a really big priority. So those are my main criteria that I'm thinking about. Of course, it has to have strong four wheel drive. That is a must for me. There's a couple of things that are a bit of a given that maybe I'm not talking about, but I'm just going with those as base assumptions. There's a few things here though that I'm not considering because they're not important to me, but they really might be important to you. So when you're making your list, I also want you to think about tow rating of the vehicle. If you want to tow some sort of big trailer or you know you have a camper van or something, obviously the tow rating of the vehicle comes into play and how good the vehicle is at towing. You know, a two-door Jeep Wrangler, they're notoriously bad at towing because of the short wheelbase. So you would strike that off your list if you were thinking about towing. I personally, I don't enjoy towing. I'm not very good at it. I don't have much practice. For where I want to go in the world, I don't think it makes sense. So I'm not even considering towing as an option. So for me, even if I bought a vehicle, if it didn't even have a tow bar, I don't even care. I'm not even going to add one. So towing is not on my list, but it absolutely might be on your list. Don't forget that one. The other one in the same vein is the number of people that the vehicle can carry. So right now it's just Katie and I going on our next expedition and carrying three people in the Gladiator, we did that a couple of times, but really not enough to justify it. So we're not really bringing along, you know, like five people. But if you're a family of five and you wanna drive up to Alaska for the summer, clearly that's a consideration. And for example, the Jeep behind me that doesn't have a back seat in it, it would be completely useless to you and you would strike it off your list. So again, make sure you think about people carrying capacity if that's a thing for you. Another thing that I really wanna focus on this time around is that I wanna improve on what I've done before. I wanna better myself. I wanna combine all the learning that I've made and build what I hope will be the best overland vehicle I've ever had. So what does that actually mean? It means that I wanna stay engaged. I wanna be interested. Could I buy a newer Wrangler and put a, the same pop-up roof on it? Absolutely, that would work. Could I get another Gladiator? Of course, I know that works. I did that, I've been there, I understand what that's about. It would work, but I'm not really excited about it. It doesn't, you know, get me up in the middle of the night and start drawing sketches of things that are gonna work. So for me, from a personal level, I'm looking to vastly improve on what I've done before. And so as a quick little recap, I drove the two-door Wrangler from Alaska to Argentina, two years living in a ground tent, the most incredible adventure of my life. When I got home, I started thinking and dreaming and while I was going to work for years, and I started planning to build this thing. And I knew straight away I wanted better living systems. So I wanted a better place to sleep, hence the pop-up roof. I wanted a fridge, I wanted a proper kitchen, I wanted to be able to cook good food. And that is exactly what I built and it worked flawlessly for Africa and it was a phenomenal vehicle. Then when I finished that trip, I started saving money, I started planning again, and I said, Australia, if I'm going to Australia, I wanna tackle the most remote routes on the entire planet. My recent video, the Canning Stock Route, you can see how that turned out. So when I was designing a vehicle, I said, it has to carry more fuel than ever before. It has to carry more water than ever before. It has to have a higher payload than ever before, so on and so forth. Designed and built the Gladiator, drove it all around Australia. So you can see each of my vehicles has been an evolution and it has been improving on certain areas or certain aspects that I really wanted to or I really needed to improve for the specific expedition at hand. And for Australia, we actually had worse living space than we did in this in Africa. And that was intentional. I was fine with that because the weather in Australia is great. Safety is not a concern. We didn't bump into too many crocodiles and snakes and spiders. So it was totally fine to spend more time outside, which I love doing anyway. But that being said, now it's time to think about the next vehicle and what I want. And Katie and I have talked at length about where we want to go in the world. We do have a destination in mind and absolutely without question, our number one priority this time is interior living space. So we know the weather is not going to be very nice where we're going. There'll be a lot of wind, there'll be a lot of rain. It'll probably be cold at times. 
So that means we want to be able to enjoy the trip and not just tolerate it. Sleeping in a ground tent, sleeping in a swag, that's not going to cut it. We want to be inside the vehicle. Hopefully we'll be able to cook inside, we'll be able to stand up and walk around. Katie really wants to be able to do yoga in there. We'll see how that works out. But all of that being said, the fundamental number one thing that I must improve on the next vehicle is better interior living space. So immediately, I'm just gonna rule out every single vehicle that's an option that does not improve on the living space that I built into this thing. So that's a nice one that helps me cull the list. The next thing that I drastically want to improve is the gas mileage or the fuel consumption of the vehicle. So I did say that 20 miles a gallon is like my lower floor of what's acceptable. And in fact, now that it's 2023, I feel like I need to increase that. I feel like I need to say 22, I would even love to get 25 miles a gallon because there's two main reasons for that. One is simply the cost, by far and away the biggest expense in what I do is fuel. And I would very much like to reduce that because the less I spend per kilometer means more kilometers of adventures, means more years of adventures. That's the goal here. Of course, there's the environmental impact as well. Burning less fuel will be better for the environment. But the other major reason is that I just can't carry that much fuel. So when we tackled the Canning stock route, Dad and I took 250 liters of gasoline, of petrol, which is 67 US gallons. That is a lot of weight, 250 kilograms, 600 pounds that we used up of our payload purely to propel the vehicle to make the distance. If the vehicle had gotten better mileage, we would have used less of that weight on the fuel. We would have been able to get more remote, go out for longer, spend less money, all of that. So better gas mileage is high, high, high on my list. And it's something that I'm not willing to compromise on on this vehicle. And then the third thing that I would like to improve upon, but I guess I'm feeling a little bit like Meatloaf when he said two out of three ain't bad. The third thing is payload. It would be nice to be able to just carry more stuff. Basically, it means more luxuries, but it also means we can stay remote for longer. If we drive out into the middle of nowhere and we're loving it, we could just stay there for 20 days if we have enough food, fuel, and water to do that. Yeah, I'm not certain that I'm going to be able to tick all three of those major improvement categories. But if I can get two of those three, I think Meatloaf would be happy and I'll be happy as well. So those are all the criteria or all the things that I'm considering that the new vehicle has to do or it has to achieve. But that's all pretty abstract. That's all kind of high level. What does that actually look like in the real world? Well, let me give you some examples. So I threw it out there on social media a month or two ago and I said, what vehicle do you think I should get for my fourth expedition and my fourth vehicle? And right off the bat, tons of people said, Dan, you should get a Tacoma because Tacomas are great. And I don't disagree, I think Tacomas are great. But when I look at it, I try to think about how is it an improvement over my Gladiator? After all, Tacomas and Gladiators, they're in the same market, they're competitors, they're within about 10% of each other in every statistic that actually matters to me. In terms of interior volume or interior living space, they're identical for all intents and purposes. You could put a go fast camper on either one of them or an AT Habitat or any of those, they're the same. In terms of gas mileage, they both get right around, let's say 20 miles a gallon. By the time we load them up and put bigger tires on them and suspension and all of that, maybe 18, maybe even 16 miles a gallon. Yikes, that's not good enough. And then when it comes to payload, the Gladiator actually has a bigger payload than the Tacoma. Gladiator's, I think, 1,600 pounds in its biggest configuration. The Tacoma's like 1,400 and something. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the Tacoma's a bad choice. For me personally, what I've done before and how I want to improve, I don't think it's actually improving anything. It's just moving sideways. You know, maybe it's 10% better this, but it's 10% worse that. 10% is not enough of an improvement to get me excited or to get me interested in what's going on here. I don't want this to turn into Toyota versus Jeep. I'm not saying this because I had a Gladiator and you know I don't think a Tacoma is as good as a Gladiator. If the roles are reversed, if I already had a Tacoma and now I was looking to build something, I wouldn't even consider a Gladiator because it's not enough of an improvement. That's what I'm saying. I'm looking for a vast improvement. So as an example, what do I mean? Well, let's look at the old school Defender 130. 
So Grizzly and Bear have been driving one of these things around the world for a long time. My friends Tony and Ruth, they're back in Africa right now driving theirs around. Here's a video I did on this vehicle. So these things, they have a payload of 2,700 pounds, flat 1,000 pounds more than the Tacoma or the Gladiator. That's a big improvement. Suddenly I'm like, okay, that is like taking things to a whole new level. In terms of gas mileage, it's really common for people to get better than 10 litres per 100, which is 23, 24, 25 US miles a gallon, especially when you equip it with the 300 TDI engine and the five speed, that's a mechanical four cylinder diesel. It'll run on kerosene. These things have been all over the planet. So suddenly you've vastly improved payload and you've improved fuel mileage. Okay, I see this vehicle is a significant step up from a Gladiator or a Tacoma. That's what I'm talking about when I say I wanna vastly improve things. Same story goes, we can compare my Wrangler here to a Forerunner or maybe even to the new Bronco, which a lot of people want me to go and get a Bronco. Is it good? Yeah, probably, I think it's great. How is it better than the Wrangler? Let's compare the payload, let's compare the fuel mileage, let's compare the interior volume. Oh, actually, it's basically the same thing. 10% better here, 10% worse there. It's not a significant improvement. And in fact, I would argue that it's a downgrade because you can't get yet a pop-up roof for it. Ursa Minor are working on one. It's probably going to be a lot similar to the one behind me, but you can't actually get it yet. So in terms of living space, the Bronco is clearly a downgrade from the Wrangler that I've built here. So why would I do that? I wouldn't really do that. It doesn't excite me. Again, what's an option? Maybe the Ineos Grenadier, it definitely has a bigger payload, it definitely gets better fuel economy, uh, it's a bigger vehicle so it has more interior space, and I know there are a couple of companies working on a pop-up roof for it. So that is the kind of vast improvement that I'm talking about. And just so you know, I'm not considering a Defender 130 because it would have to be a weird foreign import, and I'm actually not considering an Ineos Grenadier either because there's a multi-year wait list and who knows how long it would be before I even have one. I could wait, or I could hurry up and get something now, have an adventure, and then in a few years, think about a Grenadier. So I don't, I'm not willing to put off my dreams of adventure to try and wait for some vehicle that doesn't exist yet. So that's some real concrete examples of what I mean when I say I want to improve on what I've done before. So with all of that said, I'm really interested to hear what do you guys think about my criteria not necessarily suggest vehicles for me, but suggest maybe things I've forgotten about. I said the tow rating, I said the people capacity, I said four wheel drive. What else is there that an Overland vehicle provides to us that I should be thinking about that I haven't considered yet? And in the next couple of weeks, I'll do a video each week talking about specific vehicles and why they meet my criteria or why they fall short of my criteria and why I'm not actually considering them. And then of course, as time goes on, we'll get to the vehicle that I have actually bought. Katie's dad drove it today. It's on the wrong side of the country, but it's slowly making its way here and then the build will begin. And if you'd like to see it, I have photos of it right now on Patreon. I have renderings of what it's going to look like. So my supporters over there on Patreon, we've already been discussing it at length, the pros, the cons, the options. I'm really excited. This will easily be the best overland vehicle I've ever built, and I'll take it more remote than, well, maybe not that I've ever been before, but remote in a different part of the world that I'm really excited about. So all of that's over on Patreon now. There's a link in the description. You can check that out. Thanks again for watching. Thanks for supporting the channel. A whole new year, all new adventures. I'm really looking forward to it. And until next time, maybe I'll bump into you on the road.